I'm Richard West from Threshold and this is Sonic Perspectives. West, the last two years have, well, been pretty tumultuous and a big change. The newest Threshold album, Dividing Lines, is just out. The third League of Lights album with his wife, Farah, is also out, Dreamers Don't Come Down. The decision to write a sequel to Fall of the Shires was his, but that's big because he's going to do it outside of the boundaries of Threshold. He also experienced the death of his father a few months ago. He has written an autobiography, and I don't know what else he could have crammed into his time. Rich West, welcome to Sonic Perspectives. Hi, Mark. It's great to talk to you. Great to talk to you as well. Uh, I imagine you haven't sat down and, and written things up like I just did in a list, but those, it sounds like the last couple of years have been crazy for you. Yeah, I've kind of had the same list, actually, because I've got a to-do list on my computer and it's divided into those exact four sections. Um, it's a weird one because, you know, when you get busy making an album for Threshold, it's all consuming. And then when you've got other things going on at the same time, they're all consuming, too. And I don't know how you fit them all in. So I, I have this habit of getting up at five in the morning and getting quite a lot done before breakfast. Mm -hmm. So at least I start the day off well. And that always makes me feel like I'm getting somewhere. I'd like to, if we could... Um start and talk a little bit about the autobiography title of the autobiography comes directly from lost in translation from the previous threshold album uh which came first the title of the the music for the song the lyric or the autobiography no i didn't relate the lyric to me at all it was just telling the story of, of legends of the shires so um it was just a happy coincidence really um when someone suggested, why don't you write a biography? And I, I, I just thought, well, maybe a writer, why not? So um, it was, yeah, happy accident. Mm -hmm. I'm not in planning to do it. I think there's maybe a king and maybe a fighter and a star. I'm not planning to do any of those things. <laughs> <laughs> maybe a you, painter. That one sounds quite nice, but I'm a bit older. It does. It sounds great. Um, Lost in Translation, uh, in particular, as a song, tells the story of a protagonist who goes through a heck of a lot and at the end is still standing in the face of the wind and everything that has faced him or her, I guess it could be. Is that the way you view your life? No, not at all. It's not meant to be an autobiographical bi biographical, um, song by any means. Uh, I did draw, it, as any writer does, I did draw on my own experiences. Um, but it, I wasn't trying to put me in the in the song. Um, mm -hmm. I was very much just trying to tell this story of Legends of the Shires. And mm -hmm. at this point in the story, it's, it's where everything goes wrong for the guy. Um, but yeah, it does. It's, it's easier when you can draw on your own experiences, isn't it? And I, I think when you write songs, you're trying to write with, in some way, you're trying to write with universal themes that people are going to identify with. Mm -hmm. And they say of any writer, you know, you can't write it unless you've been through it. So if you want something that's going to have some sort of feeling of empathy or something you can relate to, you want to know that it's genuine. Mm -hmm. So we've all experienced those moments of trial and being tested, uh, facing things that we weren't sure that we could deal with. What in particular in your life have you faced that puts you in that kind of position? <laughs> yeah, I have to read the book. So um, to be honest, what, what it was for me was, um, I think when it was about 2012 and I've been full-time musician for about 10 years and I just reached a point where it just wasn't working for me financially anymore and I had to go back and get a, a day job again and although that doesn't sound like that's like a proper first world problem but for me it was um it just felt like the end of my world you know it was all I ever dreamt of was being full-time musician and having to give up that dream was just horrible and I went and got this job with a nice, nice company, nice group of people, and I just had the worst year of my life and hated every second of it. So um, that, that story kind of 
made its way into the song in, in some ways, but read the book to, to yes, find out. Yeah. Absolutely. Read the book. It is a great book. It, uh, it covers some areas before threshold and gets us almost up to the present day. It's pretty, pretty close. What, when you're going through something like that, what did you do to find hope, to find faith, to find whatever you needed to get through it? Honestly, I, I found it horribly difficult. And it's, like I say, it sounds a bit pathetic looking back, but I just found it a really difficult experience. But I, I kept writing. I think that's probably the thing that kept me sane. I think every time I was feeling stuff, I'd, I'd write it down. I you know, had a phone in my pocket, so I'd just open up the notepad section and just keep on writing lyrics and ideas. And a lot of those ended up being in our album for the journey that we released a couple of years later. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and then, like I say, Lost in Translation, that was written around that time as well, but it took me a bit longer to finish. So it ended up on the Legends album. So the ideas come up and they may be used, say, immediately in the next album, or they might be put aside and you could come back to them at some point. Yeah, some, th some songs take longer than others. So um, Man Who Saw Through Time was a good example. I started that. I think probably way back about 2011, 2012, something like that. And I'd had this idea and I just kept on developing it. And it was nearly ready for, for the journey. Um, mm -hmm. It wasn't quite there. So I held back a bit longer and then finished it off for, for the Legends album. Yeah. And I'm glad I waited. You know, some songs just, just take their time before you've, you've lived the story or before you've really developed the theme far enough. Mm -hmm. So each one's got sort of its individual gestation period, I guess. Yeah, pretty much. Some songs can be quite quick. You know, sometimes it's only a month or so. Mm -hmm. I'm not one of those guys who write a song in an afternoon. I, it's not that sort of music, you know. You, you not, know, not one of those. Sit on it and it has to gestate and it goes around your head just a, a thousand times. And yeah. Before you've kind of settled on something that you, you feel like you've really finished. Is it pretty clear when you reach that point that it's it's ready now? Yeah. Yeah, there's um, three phases of, of songwriting, which my wife will readily attest. Um, you, you, first of all, you think it's the best thing ever. And then you go through days, weeks or months of thinking it's the worst thing ever because all you're doing is focusing on the bits that don't work. Yeah. And then you finally get to the end and it's the best thing ever again. And if you don't get to that third stage, then you shouldn't be releasing the song. You know, you have to go through that, that pain and then that elation at the end. And that seems to be how it always works. Do you have some of those ideas that maybe maybe even came up 20 years ago that are laying off to the side that just never got to that point. <laughs> yeah, there's a song, um, one of the songs on, on the album called Lost Along the Way on, on the new album. I actually wrote the main uh, chord sequence for that that comes up in the chorus. I wrote that, I think I was about 14. But one of the first things I wrote on the piano and um, I just experimenting moving chords around while keeping the bass note the same and I came up with this sequence that I thought was really nice and it took me that long uh, I, I can't even think how many years 40 years before that actually became a finished song so some things definitely take a bit longer yeah you had to become a little bit more mature for that well actually I'd forgotten all about it. I, I found it on an old cassette somewhere and I had a of, oh, goodness I wrote that at 14 that's not too bad so yeah. I picked it up again and turned it into something cool um I've noticed that in reading the biography, you had sort of an unusual approach to things because not only were you learning about keyboards, but pretty much concurrently, you were learning about the electronics of things. And I know a lot of musicians who play keyboards and that came way later, but for you, it really was sort of a parallel path. Yeah, I was. I was recording before I had a keyboard, so I, I was using a piano and a cello. I had um, cardboard boxes for drums and um, an old ukulele we had as well in the house that I used to play occasionally. And then I'd sing as well. And it was quite a, a dreadful combination of instruments, all played and sung very badly and recorded even worse. Back, back then it was two cassette recorders sitting next to each other and you'd record onto one. You'd play it back and then sing or play something else at the same time and record that onto the second cassette recorder which I think a lot of people used to do back in the 80s. Yeah. But you end up with such a bad quality sound because you've got a tinny little speaker and a tiny little microphone. And every time you add another layer, you just get more and more hiss. So by the end, you've just got this really hissy noise going on with a kind of a song in the background. But <laughs> that's where I started. And then you kind of, through the years, you, you get better equipment and learn a bit more and try and get a bit better at the art. Yeah. Um, 
I, su I suspect you didn't keep any of that stuff around to, to offer to fan club members at some later point. Uh, I have it uh, hidden away somewhere, but it, no, that's, that, <laughs> yeah. that's, that's my development years. That's definitely nothing that's going to get released. Well, that's, that's probably for the best. Um, the new one has been out, well, as we speak, only a couple, three weeks. Um, from what I've seen, the reaction has been very positive. Uh, reviews have been good. Uh, the, the fans who have bought it seem to think it's very good as well. Tell me a little bit about the album. Yeah, well, I'm just building on that. I'm, I'm really pleased with it. Um, you know, we had a lot of people saying to us, it would be difficult to top Legends because it, it came across as one of our best albums. And certainly when we were writing that, we had quite a purple patch. We were really enjoying writing. We decided to go a bit more progressive than we had on on for the journey the album that came before it and it just for some reason just that decision made us really spread our wings and we just loved writing every minute of it um so dividing lines the fans i think maybe thought it would be difficult for us to top but we weren't really looking at it that way you know we were just writing songs that we loved and making a record from them so the process was kind of the same um the difference this time is it's obviously not a concept album uh, and also Glyn has written three of the songs on the album. So Glyn Morgan, our singer, um, he came back to the band for Legends, but we'd already written the album, so he wasn't involved in writing that one. So when it came to Dividing Lines, we were quite excited to see what he came up with because he hadn't written for us since the 90s uh, when he was last with us. So he wrote these three songs, including the single King of Nothing, which is just a, a fantastic track. Yes. And I think he, he brings just a, a slightly different flavour to the way we write. You know, it still sounds like Threshold. He just kind of brings a little bit of a, of a fresh palette to us, which is nice. Mm -hmm. um, overall, I think there's less, you know, there's not really any ballads on the album either. So it's it's got a overall a, a heavier, harder feel. It's got less of that light to go with the dark. So mm -hmm. overall, it feels like a darker album. But I think it's come across really well. Really pleased with it. Can't wait to go out and play it live. When you were preparing to, to get it together, was there a thought of either A, we continue along the same track as Shires, or we've got to do something totally different. Did you have well, faced that fork in the road? Yeah, a couple of times. I think initially we just started writing. Um, and then I kind of realized the lyrics I was writing tied in quite loosely, I suppose, to a, a story I'd come up with that could be a sequel to Legends that I'd forgotten all about. I'd written it while we were on this um, cruise, 70,000 tons of metal back in 2018. I'd come up with a storyline for Fall of the Shires and subsequently forgotten all about it. So halfway through the writing, I found this and thought, oh, this is, that could work. So I suggested it to the guys. And so we worked along that basis for a while. And then I think it just felt a bit contrived. It felt like we were writing to order. And I think Carl and Glyn both raised doubts about whether it was the right thing to do. So we, we changed direction again. So when we got to the end of making Dividing Lines, I found I had a couple of songs left over that would have been used for the um, the sequel concept. So I thought, well, I'll just write it for myself. I quite like the story. I've got these songs left over. So I just kept on writing and it was going to be another thing that just sat on my shelf with those early tapes that no one would ever hear. Um, but when I got to the end, I was quite pleased with it. So I, I played it to a record label and they were pleased with it as well. So they wanted to sign it, which was a bit of a shock. <laughs> so before I knew it, I was signing a solo project, uh, which certainly was never the intention when I started. It was just for fun. It's so, amazing how things work out sometimes. Yeah, really unexpected, and even more unexpected, I'm the singer on it, which I've never done. You know, I've, I've always done backing vocals for the band, and I'm happy to sing demos and things. But You refer to yourself as being an introvert, and I'll, I'll take you at that, but you have written an autobiography, which is not an introvert action. You're now going to front your own group, which is not an introvert action. Are you blossoming in your 50s? I, <laughs> I don't know. I just felt like I was... I needed to start saying yes to a few more things, I think. I, I don't know what, I was talking to Carl about it a while ago, and I, I think in some ways I was kind of, I don't know, moved by, by my dad, really, and, you know, he was obviously getting ill in his his later years. And we talked a lot about his life and all the stories from his past, and I think that's kind of what inspired me to write my story as well. But... It just made me think, you know, life is fleeting. I, I shouldn't keep on putting off these things. So when someone suggested writing a book, I thought, yeah, why not? And when 
you know, Atomic Fire said, well, can we sign you? I thought, yeah, why not? I didn't really stop and think, hang on, I'm not a singer or hang on, I'm not a front man or a performer. I just thought, why not? You know, and I've got a good friend who pretty much anytime anything comes up, he says, if not now, then when? And I think, well, yeah, you're right. <laughs> so so I went for it. And um, so far, it's working quite well. Did your father get a chance to read your stories or hear your stories before he passed? <sighs> no, sadly not. Um, I, yeah, so I'd written up one of his stories. Well, he'd written up one of his stories from the past, which I turned into a hard bad book for him, um, which he, he really liked. He was really proud of that. And actually the night before he died, I was sitting in his room with him and I read him his whole book. And I actually had it in mind to um, read in my book the next day. I had a, a, a copy of it with me, um, but he died that morning. So I never got to do that. So that was a, a big regret. But I know he was really proud of the fact that I'd done it. And he kept yeah. telling me he couldn't wait to see it. So I'm obviously really sad he never got to see that. If I'm getting into something here, I shouldn't. Just let me know. Were you with him when he passed? Yes, I was. Yeah, yeah me and my sister were both there. Mm -hmm which I'm yeah, very grateful for. Yeah, it's sort of a mind blowing experience, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, I, I'm still reeling from it, to be honest. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, it just reinforces, I think, how fleeting everything is and we have to take care of each moment and take care of the most important things, the people in our lives the other stuff can sort of take care of itself ultimately. And I suspect having read what you've written and not just the book, but some of your lyrics, I think that comes through as well. Yeah, and I'm, I'm you know, I'm really glad I get a bit nervous about the whole um, Oblivion Protocol side project occasionally and think, well, goodness, what if they want us to go and tour and I find I'm a terrible front man or something? But I figure, no, let's just go for everything. You know, jump in and enjoy the water. That's what I think. So when is this due out? Uh, it'll be next year sometime. So I'm just mixing it at the moment, actually. I was yeah. working on it when you called. So I'm, I'm planning to deliver it to the label by the end of January. Mm -hmm. So after that, goodness, however long it takes to press final. As we found with dividing lines, it takes quite a long time. But yeah. hopefully sometime in 23. So from a musical standpoint, will there be some themes that will cut across the the two albums as well as some lyrically some themes yeah big time um certainly it'll sound familiar you know it's meant to be a sequel to legends i didn't hold back you know it's got a lot of the same sort of ideas and sound effects going on but it's not quite as heavy um i haven't got that sort of voice that glenn's got so the music's written just to, to back off a little bit there's lots of heavy riffs and everything still but it's just balanced in a different way and there's a few more I guess kind of Pink Floydy sort of sections, you know, where it's a bit softer, it just sits back a bit, that suits my voice a bit better. Mm -hmm. So it, it'll be familiar, but not at the same time. And, you know, that's kind of what I wanted. I was never planning it to be another Threshold record. Yeah. If it was going to be that, then I'd just do it with Threshold. But um, it's, it's kind of nice to have, you know, I've, I've said it before, but with all of the Star Wars side projects that come off, you know, your Mandalorians and Andor and everything, it's kind of nice that you get to go back to the world, but from a different perspective. So that's very much what I've tried to do with this one is you're back in the world of legends, but seeing it through different ties. Through different ties and a different time period because you had, when you were writing before, it was an entirely different life in some respects because uh, Shires, the first, that came out before all the, the COVID quarantine, et cetera. And you've had a lot happen since then. Yeah, and obviously those things inspire how you feel and what you write. And I think that's probably one of the reasons that Dividing Lines is a slightly darker record. It's, it's just you know, inspired by what we've just been through. And it kind of makes its way into the lyrics. You know, we haven't tried to do a commentary on COVID or anything else, but you know, it does kind of flavor what you've been writing about. In, in fact, you've mentioned, and I've seen this in interviews with, with you and with Carl and with Glenn, that you're not necessarily referring to specific individuals or specific forces that they're coming up against. It's not really political in that sense, but it's still universal. Oftentimes the individual against the power structure or something that is 
try to put them down. I, and I've seen that in, in most of the albums. It's it, it has a universal theme in that regard and an encouragement to each individual to to do what they can. Yeah, nicely put, we should switch places. <laughs> um, I think I look back to a, albums like Subsurface back in 2004, and there's it's quite political in terms of its outlook, but it's not really political in terms of sounding like a manifesto. You know, mm-hmm. it takes those themes, it looks at things like corruption and propaganda and, I uh, don't know, all sorts of topics in that sort of area, but it's trying to turn them into a story. Yeah, a bit like George Orwell's 1984, which kind of partly inspired that album, actually. Um, so I felt with Dividing Lines, it's kind of picking up where that left off. And songs like Complex are really picking up where songs like Mission Profile left off and just kind of revisiting that concept in the times that we're in now. So we're certainly not trying to commentate on what's going on in the world, but we're, we're drawing on those experiences and just, I, I don't know, I think it's just about getting people to open their eyes, you know, and see what's going on, not necessarily just accept everything they're told. I'm not trying to turn the world into a bunch of subversives, but I, I think, you know, nothing's ever quite as straightforward as it's put to you, and it's it's good to be vigilant, I think. Yeah. yeah. In defence condition, um, which a lot of people have pointed out as a, as a highlight for them, and it closes out the album, I think, very powerfully, it has a pretty dystopian view of of life. Uh, again, sort of like 1984, where so much is going wrong and people are lying, people are buying lies. Um, it's pretty powerful in that regard. I, I was struck when I wrote, read the lyrics to that as well as the music. Yeah, I think the idea of this is my defense condition is it basically this is how I've had to set my worldview to defend myself from from what's going on outside. And it's um it's almost like building a bubble around yourself to just protect yourself from from the barrages from outside. So that's that's how I remember it anyway. I'd have to read all the words again. Actually it took me ages to write that one. Um quite often Carl will just send me an instrumental and want me to write a song to it. And a song like The Box off for the journey, I already had all the lyrics mapped out. And when he sent me a song, I thought, oh, those lyrics fit really well. So it was quite an easy job to put them in. But with this one, I started with nothing and trying to write a 10 minute song from nothing is quite hard because you realize you have to have quite a big theme to actually find enough lyrics to actually tell the story in the way you want to over 10 minutes. So it took me months to write that one. Um, I was pleased with how it came out, but it had to be quite a big theme. So I kind of took on, you know, trying to portray how a lot of people I know feel at the moment and just put that into words in a way that sounded hopefully arty. (laughs) <laughs> one of the themes and this is personal and i'm sure each individual gets out of it whatever they get out based on their experience but uh, you do throw in comments about god and faith and it seems to me part of what you're getting at is that you are in this world but not of this world uh, which of course comes from scripture as well yeah, I guess so. I hadn't seen it quite in those direct terms, but yes, I see what you're saying, and that, that does come across. Um, yeah, it's 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 a strange that's a strange scripture, isn't it? Yes. But um, you got me thinking in different lines now. But it, it, it wasn't quite from that direction. But it, it's it's more in terms of just not accepting everything that you're mm-hmm. told on face value. Didn't mean to throw you a curveball there. That was a curveball. It's it's late in the evening here when you're talking to me, so <laughs> it's not quite so quick on my feet. <laughs> yeah, what you mean? Um, actually, some of your early experiences, and I I guess it's okay to get into this because it's in the book. Uh, some of the earliest things you talk about in the book are about faith, about going off to a church camp and people praying over you, and a food allergy that you just had ripped your life apart suddenly was gone. Yeah, that still astonishes me to that to this day. You know, I, like I said, I had this food coloring allergy. It made me hyperactive. It really messed up my childhood, messed up my school life and my school work. Um, and yeah, one day they just said, do you, want, do you want us to pray for you? And they did. And I was I was healed, which, you know, at the age of 14 was just life changing. Um, I've been to churches since with various ailments that needed healing and not got healed. So you know, it doesn't seem to be a, a guarantee, 
So I, I still don't know why that worked and why other things don't, but it's certainly, it's an experience I can't deny. And I, I know it happens. So um, yeah, life changing for me. Are you still a person of faith? Yes, but I'm um, more speculative these days. I, 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 I think I tried to analyze everything too much. <laughs> that, that happens. I think that's the human condition. Yeah, I think you're right. But yes, but, I'm, I'm still a man of faith, but I'm, I, I think I'm probably a bit less dogmatic than I used to be. Mm -hmm. In other words, not quite doctrinal, but it, connecting with whatever power is, is the creator. That, yeah, that's the plan. I, I remember I used to go to a church, yeah, you know, back in the nineties or something, and when um, uh, what's it called? Well, think that's like I said, it's late in the evening. I can't remember. Um, when you're sticking needles in people for, for healing them. Acupuncture. My, sorry. Acupuncture. Acupuncture. That's the word. Yes. So acupuncture was was suddenly becoming a thing in in some um, alternative health circles in Britain. And a lot of people in the church were really against it because they said, well, that can't be right. That's a lot of nonsense. You should stay away from it. It's almost like they were saying, oh, that's from the devil. And I think that's that sort of dogma where you get confused between what you believe is faith and what you're comfortable with in your Western society. And when people bring in something from outside, you think, oh, that can't be right because it's not what I'm used to. And so I think that's the dogma I've tried to get away from and try to be more open to, to what's out there. Yeah. Well, for... I think that's the difference between religion, which is a man-made construct, and faith, which should be a relationship between a person and God, and which doesn't have that doctrinal stuff there. Yeah, absolutely that, yeah. Like I say, we should swap places here. A lot more lucid than me today. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but church also had an important role in your life later because you were playing piano or keyboards at church when you first saw your wife, right? Yep, I can still picture it to this day. Can you really? I can, yeah. Wonderful moment. It's one of those moments where they're the only person in the universe. You just, I just saw her and I, I never met her. I just thought there's something there. I don't know what it is. Obviously, she was really nice to look at, which helps, but I just felt like there was something more like a connection. And it turned out there was, so we're now 25 years married. Yes. Um, do you remember what you were playing that morning or did it all of a sudden go into a haze with her taking over the, the focus? I haven't got a clue. I could have gone into the Star Spangled Banner for all I know. I haven't got, I haven't <laughs> got the focus yet. <laughs> one of those moments, my hands were doing one thing. My head was thinking something else entirely. Well, you said, too, that your first date was to go see Iona and you can't remember a darn thing about that concert. Not a lot, no. I just remember standing next to Farah and it was a... Yeah, I can't remember the music, but it was a great night. <laughs> we'll assume that with Bainbridge and company, it was a good concert as well. Yeah, I spoke to him actually a couple of years ago and just mentioned that that was our first date. He was quite touched. I'll, I'll bet he was. He would have enjoyed that quite a bit. Um, while, while we're on this one subject, I got one more question, and that is you mentioned in the book that your music is a conversation with God or at least that's the way you perceive it at times. What are you saying to him and does he respond? What does he say to you? I think that was um, in the context of when we'd written Hypothetical um, and I was having a chat with John about what we should call the album. And I'd explain to him some of my lyrics were conversations with God. So Long Way Home would be a good example. Um, I, I won't quote the lyrics to you now because I'll probably get them wrong. But it was just the way I used to write. Um, later on, songs like Flags and Footprints were very much a personal song, just talking yeah. to God as well. So anyway, I mentioned this to John, and so he thought instantly, yes, we should call the album Hypothetical, because um, obviously what you're talking about is totally hypothetical, because he had very different religious views to me. And I remember I was quite put out at the time that he, he thought that's what we should call it. And I poured my heart and soul into these lyrics. But actually, I, I thought about it later, and I thought that was a really, really good album title, because mm -hmm. you know I shouldn't expect him to appreciate my views any more than I appreciated his you know it's um mm -hmm. it was an album of two very different sides of of the coin and yeah. so it, it yeah, worked out it was a good title actually one of my favorite album titles mm -hmm. November 24th 1992 so that's that November 
dates keep coming back. Uh, that was when Carl asked you to join Threshold. Was Did you see that coming or was it a surprise or what? Yeah, big surprise. I didn't, for, for a start, I didn't know there was a band called Threshold. Um, I was, I'd been in a band with him called Mercy Train and we were kind of a grungy pop rock sort of band. And we'd made an album and off the back of that, I'd got asked to go on tour with another band he was in called Shadowland, which was fronted by Clive Nolan from Arena. And um, we were doing a European tour with them. And I, I loved it. I was just out being a session player, doing my first tour. It was fantastic. And it was just near the end of the tour. We we got to Lille where we were doing a, a gig in a, a little basement somewhere. And we had a couple of days off. And I remember I was in a restaurant with Carl and he, he started telling me about Threshold. And they'd already recorded Windland, pretty much finished it. But they just had kind of basic keyboards on there. Carl had been playing kind of chords and pads and things and he wanted somebody to come in just to put a few extra flavors put a few solos on so he asked me if I'd come and play on it so I, I didn't realize I was joining the band at that point uh, mm -hmm. I just thought yes I'm, I'm loving being a session player I'm, I'll say yes to all at this point so it was quite a surprise actually then I, I did a few days at the studio and then I found I was being asked back to do photo shoots and then asked to go on tour I thought hang on a sec have I joined a band I didn't really realize so it wasn't, wasn't my intention and prog metal wasn't something I even knew about back then. But it's something I grew into and um, here we are 30 odd years later still doing it. So at that point, you couldn't have had any idea of where things would progress from there. No, I think at that age, you think, well, by the time you get to your mid 30s, you're going to stop doing rock and roll anyway, because it's a, a young man's game. Yeah. But as, as it turned out, we all got old with it and no one minded because the fans got old as well. So it's it's genuinely a surprise to still be doing it at 55, but I'm now fully expecting to still be doing it at 65. Might as well. Probably don't have anything better to do. <laughs> True enough. Well, I live for music, so I'd, I'd feel pretty lost without it. It seems to me that the 30 years that have gone since that first uh, inquiry about you becoming part of the band is really, to some extent, the story of your relationship with Carl, because other band members have come and gone. Drummers, drummers have come and gone. Singers have switched in and out. And yet it's it's you guys that formed the foundation. As time went on, you were working more and more together in composing and coming up with lyrics. Um, it's been an evolution for you guys in that way, hasn't it? Yeah, I think we, we clicked really from the minute we started working together. So we, we obviously, we, the first album we made together was the Mercy Train album. Um, we were in the studio every night producing it and mixing it, and we just really got to know each other and found we worked really well together. Mm -hmm. um, and then, yeah, for Threshold, it's just something we both love doing. And you know, I, I could never see myself stopping, and, and nor could Carl. And it's, it's genuinely a bit of a surprise that other people did leave. So I thought it was such a, a great band to be in, but I guess everyone has life, pulls them in different ways. I always look at back my favourite bands like Queen and, and marvel at the fact they managed to stay together for their whole career. You yeah. Even though they had struggles through the way, you know, people fall out, that sort of thing. But they managed to keep going, and I kind of wish Threshold had been one of those bands as well. But, you know, things don't work out like that. But really nice that, you know, even when people do leave, like Lynn or Damien, they come back later. So mm -hmm. it's like nothing's lost forever. Yeah, well, certainly with the the, the singer, uh, you keep coming back, retreading through the same guys for the most part, starting with Damien and then Glenn and then Damien and then Mac and then Damien and then Glenn. And it's like a carousel. It really is, isn't it? You've got it mapped out there. <laughs> but yeah, I, it's to be honest, as, as nice as it would have been to just have one singer all the way through, it's just been great to be able to work with all, all three of them because they're all such talented singers and um, one of the things that make me nervous about singing my own album because I know I haven't got the same sort of voice as them in fact I was kind of thinking Atomic Fire the label I've signed with we're gonna come back straight away with an email saying of course you'll have to get a proper singer in but they haven't said it yet so I'm, I'm getting away with it so far there's there you go your insecurities have been proven wrong <laughs> um do you think that each singer brought something that made their recordings, let's say, very individual to them? Or how easily could the next singer 
go back and do the songs on an album that he had not participated in. Well, I think that bit's just about range, really. You know, Damien's got a, a higher range than, than Glenn. So um, we did find when we made Legends of the Shires that one of the songs, uh, Subliminal Freeways, we'd written in a certain key, or I'd written in a certain key for Damien. And when Glenn came to sing it, it didn't work for him at all. So we had to re-record all the music in a lower key for him. Mm-hmm. That, that's the kind of the practical constraint of it. And it's one of the reasons with Glenn, we don't redo so many songs from the Damien era because they just don't suit his voice so well. And either we'd have to relearn them all in a different key on the instruments, then they'd sound a bit funny. Mm-hmm. Or we just pick the songs that, that work for him. And, you know, when you've got 12 albums to pick from, it's easy to find enough songs to fill a set. Mm-hmm. I would assume that because each of them brings their own personality uh, to the frontman position, to the vocalist, that also may bring out some new textures and colors in how that song is presented in, in concert. Oh, definitely, yeah. Everyone's got their own personality, haven't they? And, and you can hear it with Damien. He's got quite a different voice from, from Mac or Glenn. Um, mm-hmm. And it's really nice to hear the songs kind of brought out in a different way. Um, but I think I always prefer it when the singer who made the record does the actual performance as well. You know, I always felt a bit bad when we'd go out on tour and we'd have one person singing the album and then you'd have a different singer going out on tour. It felt like you're not quite giving the right experience to the fans of what the record was supposed to be. So it's kind of nice that we can go out now and do lots of songs that Glenn was involved with. And to be honest, I mean, he does suit the the, the Mac era songs really well as well. Mm-hmm. So I'm, I'm quite happy that we do, do those as well. What has it been about five, six years that it has been the five of you together, a solidified group. Yeah, it feels really, really, really good. And it's nice to do two records in a row with the same lineup. That's uh, yeah. always yeah. a bonus when you're in threshold. So that's <laughs> nice. But as, as I've always said through the years, we have no time, no plans to change the lineup anytime soon. But you, you never know what's around the corner, do you? But we're all just getting on great. You know, we're, you know, I think when you're a bit older, you don't have quite so many frictions between people. You know, everyone softens around the edges a bit. So I should very much hope we don't change lineup again. It seems to me that uh, there's sort of a legend around Mac that has grown up since he left. And maybe that happens whenever a charismatic front man leaves and then dies young. Um, What you relate in the book is not all good, though. I felt a bit bad about that, you know. Don't speak hell of the dead. And um, but I was telling the story of the band, you know, and, and for every high there's a low. And obviously Mac had a big problem with drinking, and that translated itself into the band and into our performances. So I didn't feel like I could leave those bits out. So I hope I told it sensitively. But um, yeah, it's it's sad, you know, looking back. He was such a great guy and such a phenomenal singer, but he had the that darker side of the drinking that. That always got in the way in the background, you know, and uh, I think that's ultimately what killed him. So it's, it's a tragedy, you know. Quite a few friends I know from that era died um, from alcohol, and it was just that thing about getting on tour and just drinking too much. But then Mac would go home and he'd still be drinking when he got home again. And um, yeah, just really sad. Always kind of thought that we'd have a chance to get together again and, you know, have that reunion and, you know, have a have a chat again and just have a laugh but you know he's gone now and it's um yeah very sad moment when i read some of the stories that you had about him where he couldn't sing or he forget all the lyrics or he climbed that light lighting rig up to the top um all sorts of things that occurred I have to admit, the first question I had is, why didn't you fire him at a particular point? Because for all that to build up over time, is that's difficult on the rest of you guys. It was hard. I think partly we didn't really want to fire anybody, you know. Um, Also, he's just a nice guy and a great singer. And for every bad show, there was a good one. So it wasn't, you know, if every show had been bad, I think it would have been a, a decision we'd have had to think about a bit more seriously but he'd always come back and do a great show again and then you know we're all good friends and you know we didn't want to see him go and his voice I mean you say we, we talk about him in, in hushed tones since he died but it's he had that gorgeous magical voice 
and I listen back to those records and it's just something special going on with him there. And we didn't want to see that go, you know, we wanted him to, to have a good life, be happy. And I, I remember when we did Critical Mass, he, he did stop drinking and he was quite different. I, I talk about it a bit in the book. But yeah. he, was, he was transformed, you know, he, he said he felt like a weight was lifted off his shoulders. Mm-hmm. So it was so sad to find a year later he, he'd started drinking again. Threshold has never been exactly the band that got into the rock and roll lifestyle of sex, drugs, beer, whatever, rock and roll, porn. You just never went into that, did you? No, a nice cup of tea before the show. That was, <laughs> I think we used to drink a bit when we were younger. I remember the first couple of tours we we'd um yeah, you, you as a young band going into a, a venue for the first time and you go backstage and there's a fridge full of a hundred beers and you, you can't help yourself having a few. But we found we were just constantly putting on fairly bad shows because you know your fingers aren't working so well, your brain's not working so well. And it took us quite a few tours before we realized that that was the reason. Or, before we admitted to ourselves anyway that that was the reason. So Mm -hmm. we eventually stopped any drinking before the show and just have a glass of wine after the show. And that's that's a bit more relaxed, that works for us. I have a funny feeling though, that you may have gone on tour with bands that did live that lifestyle or tried to. Yeah, everyone's different, aren't they? Um, I know the band you're referring to. I'm gonna let people buy the book to find out that story. Yeah. (laughs) But you know, every band's different, Uh, I think, you know, you watch a movie like The Dirt by Motley Crue and it's the polar opposite to what Threshold is. But I think a lot of that comes from if if you got to the top of your game and you've got too much money and too much time, a lot of, you know, you read even, you know, people like Phil Collins talk about sitting around and you start drinking because there's nothing else really to do. Um, with Threshold, we never reached that peak, you know, we never were making quite enough. We were always having to work hard. And so we never felt we could just sit back and spend a year sitting on the sofa getting drunk, you know, we had to keep on making money. It's yeah. still, still true today, to be honest. So it probably saved us a bit from ourselves. Mm-hmm. Can we switch switch tracks just a little bit and talk about League of Lights? Um, correct me if I'm wrong, didn't you just get off the road from doing a, a few gigs with your wife? Yeah, just the one, actually. Um, we okay. went, to, went to the Netherlands to do a show. Um, yeah, that was great fun. We don't do many live shows. It's... Um, for some reason, one of the things we kind of slip between the cracks in terms of genres. It's it's just something we did for ourselves, really. And so to have people who like it is always a bit of a bonus. Um, but we did um, a support show with, I don't know if you remember the band Propaganda. Yes. They were big, big over in Europe. So the two girls from that, um, Claudia and Susanna, have reformed and they call themselves ex-Propaganda. Yeah. And they've been doing some shows. So we had the privilege of supporting them. Uh, which is kind of fun for me. I was a bit of a fan back in the eighties, so I even took along a couple of old twelve-inch singles and got them to sign them, which was a nice moment. Yeah, yeah. Not the sort of thing I normally do, but I thought I'll make an exception this time. Mm-hmm. It League of Lights is sort of ethereal, uh, or at least that's the word that comes to my mind when I was watching videos, listening to the music. Uh, it really is a listening experience. you got to sort of sit down and let it wash over you. Is that is that the impact you're looking for? Yeah, that's nicely put. Um, when we were looking at how to describe ourselves, ethereal, ethereal pop, that would have been a good name for it. Um, yeah, we just wanted something that we, that we found beautiful, you know, something that we really enjoyed making and really enjoyed just being absorbed in. Um, with Farah's voice, it's kind of got a dreamy quality. So really try and focus on that, especially with the latest album and just, you know, really make that come across as as a beautiful sound Mm -hmm. and then try and construct the keyboards and music around it to not get in the way, but just support it in the right way. And we ended up with quite a dreamy sort of sound, sort of somewhere between dream pop and and art rock. So as I say, not not a genre that's easy to to place these days or to say, oh, you should go on tour with X, Y and Z. So um, like I say, we don't do many shows, but when we do, it's great fun. I would I would say ethereal, but you also add in the power drums of Mark Zonder, who's not been ever called ethereal, I don't think. No, that was um I think yeah, for our debut album, we were looking at being a bit more symphonic, sort of prog metal sort of territory. But I think even while we were making the record, we realized it wasn't quite the sound that suited us. So I'd got Mark in to do drums and he did a great job. Uh, I loved his work on Fate's Warning, and so to have him on the record was fantastic. 
Yeah. I don't think the songs necessarily gave him the chance to be who he was because he was trying to be what my demos were. But he was very gracious and, and played what I'd written anyway. But he sounds great as always. You know, he's got such a good ear for tonality and, and sounds and for what's going to work. And then I got Root Jolly in on guitar, who is still working with me today, which is amazing guy from Within Dentation. You know, he's, he's out touring arenas all over the world with, with his band. He's just been out with Iron Maiden in America. Mm-hmm. And um, to come and play on my little project, I'm, I'm quite honoured. Mm-hmm. Is that one of the, the cool parts about reaching a level of success in the music biz is that you get to perform or record or work with some people that you're just absolutely dying to work with? Yeah, it's such a privilege, to be honest. You know, when you're younger, you just look up at all these heroes and idols and think they're untouchable and you're on a totally different level. And then just being in music this long, you realize you can just make friends with them. It's just astonishing. I even found the same with propaganda. You know, after the show, we went and had a few drinks together and I had to pinch myself and think, hang on, I used to idolize these guys when I was you know, a teenager, had all their records in my room. And now I'm just here having a nice chat with them. And it's, um, yeah, a privilege I, I don't take for granted. Mm-hmm. So we're coming to the end of 2022, I think, a year that will live on in many of our memories for everything that it provided or took away. Um, we know that you got another album, the second uh, segment of, of uh, Shires coming up. What else? You're going to do some live gigs with Threshold or, or what? <laughs> yeah, I'm already looking at next year, wondering how I'm going to fit it all in. So I'll, I'll deliver the Oblivion Protocol album end of January, I hope, if I can get it finished. Uh, we've got another League of Light show, I think, in March, just a, another one off a festival in the UK. And then we'll be off on tour with Threshold. So um, we'll be getting our rehearsals done for that, getting ready to go. We've got shows from April onwards, and that will take us through the summer. Um, and in the meantime, we've um, agreed to remix, I think it's three of our old albums. So we're remixing Wounded Lands, Extinct Instinct and Clone. And to make it even better, we've got an old live recording from 99 where we played our second clone concert in London and we recorded it at the time with a plan to release it but the recording got really distorted and back then the technology wasn't really there to restore that sort of thing but it is these days so we went back to the old tapes we managed to restore them so that's going to be a bonus disc on clone so um, we agreed to do it thought it sounded like a great idea and then he realized just how much time's involved just things like back then, if you did an album with keyboards on, you wouldn't put the keyboards on tape. You just play them via MIDI off the computer. So it would trigger directly off the keyboard. We haven't got those keyboards anymore. So trying to find all those old sounds again is, is taking weeks and weeks, just trying to source all of these different, whether it's on a plug-in or buying the old keyboard again. So it's been a huge project, which we're halfway through, and I don't know quite where we're going to get the time to finish it off. But in theory, sometime next year, those three albums will be coming out again fully remixed and remastered. In terms of your shows, I know you've already got some festivals lined up for next summer, at least they're on your your website. Uh, Any chance you're going to come to this side of the pond? Uh, We don't know yet. We're just booking up Europe at the moment, but I very much hope so. I think it's it's one of those things. We we nearly toured America many years ago and it all fell through. And for some reason, we, we never really put our foot through that door again. So we, we've only been coming over to do festivals and we know that isn't good enough and we would very much like to do an American tour. So I, I hope so, is all I can say at this stage. Or you could do another cruise if you want to out of Florida. I, it, that is my favourite experience ever at Threshold. You know, you're know, going on a Caribbean cruise, getting some winter sun and you're getting paid for it. It's fantastic and it's such a nice experience. We're always the, the least heavy band on there. Well, always, we've done it twice. You know, you've got all these real death metal and heavy metal um, bands on there. And then we go along and we're playing these kind of catchy prog songs. And it um, always surprises me that we, we get invited. But I, I hope we'll be back again. It's just a great experience. I'd recommend it to anybody. Really fun. You've got 60 bands. You've got 3,000 fans there. And it's just one great big family having a great time. Yeah. And yeah, there yeah are, we'll be back, definitely. Yeah. There are a lot more of those types of cruises that are coming up i'm joel finally got me to sign up for cruise to the edge which it started off as a yes cruise and then became a prog and prog metal 
cruise. And I can't believe what we're going to see and hear and experience over a few days. Uh, Maybe we could get you for that, too. Yeah, I think I saw the lineup. They've got an incredible lineup, haven't they? Really, really good selection of bands. Um, yeah, we'd love to do it. Yeah. We'd be very happy if, if they ever invited us. That would be great fun. Especially if it could occur in, in the winter in England and you could experience the sun of the Caribbean. Sounds good to me. Yeah. Well, I appreciate your time more than you know, and I'm sorry with the, some of the technical issues that we had. And uh, I hope we haven't kept you away from your bedtime. <laughs> yeah, no problem at all. I'm sorry if I come across a bit sleepy. Hopefully you can ah. edit out those gaps between words. Well, I'm trying to remember what it is I want to say, but it's been a, a pleasure to talk to you, Mike. And that is Richard West of Threshold and League of Lights and Oblivion Protocol and his new autobiography, Maybe a Writer, and Lord knows what else is going to be coming up. We'll see in this coming year with all the things, all those projects coming to fruition. I'm Mark Boardman, and for the latest news, reviews, and interviews, tune in to Sonic Perspectives.